Good morning. Um, it's such a pleasure to uh, meet my respected colleague from all over the world, um, as well as my beloved and missed Korean landscape comrade who made such an effort to host this global event through the pandemic. Thank you, Professor Zhou, for having me, uh, and congratulations to you and the leadership of KILA for such a successful Congress. I can imagine how challenging it must have been to host a global event through um, this difficult time. I also feel great about having a part of parking designers today, this morning, uh, who came down to Gwangju uh, to watch what I'm saying. Um, the title of today's talk is How Thinking Like a Landscape Architect Can Help Save the World. But before we begin, uh, this first slide of today is the only slide that is irrelevant to my talk but still very relevant to IFLA, so please bear with me. Um, in 1992, so exactly 30 years ago, in the city of Gyeongju, Korea, the 29th IFLA World Congress was hosted. And there formed this organization titled the International Association of Landscape Architecture Students, agreed by those student leaders signed here, including Yoon Jin Park, who is my partner of Park Kim, who is very sad uh, for not being able to be here today. But he wanted me to help him to find those friends. So if any of you recognize the name of either yours or your colleagues, please let me know after the talk so that I can help you to be reconnected. And both Yunjin and I really hope that the students here today also are making this venue a memorable and priceless experience for your professional life to come because you are the leaders of the future of the profession. Okay, the, the real start. I think my talk will be about 35 minutes, so a bit less than 40 minutes. The title of my talk today is How Thinking Like a Landscape Architect Can Help Save the World. I'm now talking about a Marvel movie in which a hero or a team of Avengers saving the world. That is why there is help between can and save. As professionals who have to have certain license to call themselves as such, I believe we must contribute to solve the problem the world is facing, the climate change. Let me begin by introducing two books that heavily influenced my recent research, teaching, and practice, as well as this talk today. So on the left, Timefulness, How Thinking Like a Geologist Can Help Save the World, written by Marcia Bjornarud, a geologist in America and also educator, the book that made me think what we can do as a professional. Marcia believed that the layered perspective of geology has made her aware of the short-term thinking common in a society wedded to political terms of office and the news cycle, all of which has, she argues, contributed to our inadequate response to climate change. So she claims that we need to have geological literacy to instill deeper knowledge of planetary rhythm and processes, thinking like a mountain. On the right, how to do nothing, resisting the attention economy, written by Jenny O'Dell, which helped me survive through the pandemic, not just because I was not able to do things that I usually be able to, but also by letting me look at things that I usually go ignoring such as layers of time in the landscape of my own town. Rock is a verb, not a noun. This is a sentence quoted from Marcia's book that I would probably have a hard time to understand if I have not read these two books, but now I am totally with it. And this is the ethos that I'd like to share with all of you through my talk today. So what is timefulness in landscape architecture? How can we respect the layers of time and place? We indeed are asked by many clients to design and build a timeless landscape. If any of you recognize those humongous pine trees at the background photo, I think you know what I meant. But can that be our excuse forever, not to think about the accumulated time we've been ignoring? Reading these two books, actually made me look back what my practice Park Kim has done for the past 18 years 
And indeed, it led me to revisit the research Yunjin and I published in 2007 upon returning to Seoul from the Netherlands, Gangnam Alternative Nature, the Experience of Nature Without Parks. In the essay, Yunjin and I argued that citizens of Gangnam managed to survive without urban parks, thanks to the alternative forms of nature, which do not necessarily look natural, that facilitate the experience of nature. The mapping exercise of the contra map of Gangnam, dated 1950, on top of the current road layout, reminded me the fact that the most part of the most expensive land of Korea was once covered with rice paddies, and the urban development wasn't necessarily respected in pre-existing condition. Back then, I was mostly interested in the experience of nature that alternative nature offers to us. But the recent climate changes forced me to ponder alternative nature that can function like nature we lost. Cities became stronger in terms of protecting themselves against the tidal flooding, thanks to the embankment and all but become more and more vulnerable to pluvial flooding. We all saw that what happened to Seoul a few weeks ago, as you see, which was horrifying. But what's even more horrifying is the fact that it wasn't the first time that we saw it. It happened 10 years ago, and several smaller but still intimidating floodings in between. It is not that the city of Seoul didn't do anything after the flooding. A new pumping facility was constructed, as well as 900 meter in total culvert after the tragic flood and landslide of 2011 in Gangnam. But what this year's flood tells us is increasing gray infrastructure alone won't protect us when we have 200 year return interval rain every two years due to the climate change. It is not just Seoul that suffers from the cloudburst and resulting pluvial flood, of course. Phoenix, New York City, and Copenhagen are others among many others. So during the last two and a half years, a time when I wasn't able to travel around and to meet people as freely as the pre-COVID era, my concern and enthusiasm were, um, can, we, can we do something about this with the expertise of landscape architecture? If so, what can we do? And what do we know? For example, is the fact that Gangnam was literally covered with rice paddies till the 70s, related to the chronic pluvial flooding in the area? The answer seems yes. I'll be talking about what I meant by thinking like a landscape architect, by sharing what I'm doing in terms of research, teaching, and practice of the past few years through the spectrum of scale, teaching, scale, collaboration with other disciplines in planar vertical dimension. And I think that is the way how a landscape architect should and can think and do. As I shared earlier, most of my readings are written by non-landscape and architectural intellectuals these days, engineers, scientists, artists, and cultural writers. Young Ne Ryu and Ju Han Bei of Seoul National University found out that only two, and two or three meters deep below the surface of Gangnam their surprisingly high soil organic carbon stock, as high as in a natural forest, due to the land's past being rice paddies, and those subterranean soil layers could be overlooked carbon hotspots in urban ecosystems, which is fascinating findings, right? But what good? What's good if we don't do anything about it? So uh, let me share the, my way of reacting to the climate change and those efforts coming out of the other fields, like the one we just saw, through the landscape architectural method in research, education, and practice. These findings and inspiration from non-landscape readings intrigue me to think whether if there is a connection between what happened on the land before and what is happening now. I started mapping the geomorphologies of Seoul that we lost through its urbanization. Of course, most of the fine tributaries of Han River, Tanchan, were buried and topsoils were either removed, relocated, and covered with impermeable, impermeable materials like concrete and asphalt, which make the Gangnam surface 90% impermeable at this moment. And also many of the ridges and valleys are gone, 
which obviously have some level of relationship to the current phenomena of urban heat islands and fluvial flooding of Seoul. During the research for mapping the lost nature, I also realized that we are losing literally tons of groundwater at regular basis. For example, in the Samsung subway station area, 100 tons of groundwater, literally 100 tons of groundwater, has been lost every day, and Seoul Metropolitan Government had a plan to artificially recharge the aquifer with tap water during the construction, during the ongoing construction of the intermodal transit center underneath. So I went in deeper to map out the fluctuating groundwater level of Gangnam area, the data of January to, January to June 2021, you see here. Finally overlaid with the soil data to see if there are any area that are more apt to artificial recharging of groundwater. So that, for example, if there's an opportunity of creating wetland or bioswale, those can be rerouted to that area so that the recharging can be more efficient and resilient. <clears throat> Sorry. While I was digging into Seoul, I concurrently started looking at 11 other mid-latitude cities in Northern Hemisphere that suffers from similar climatic upheavals, urban heat and fluvial flooding. And I mapped their lost nature with an assumption in my mind that there must be close relationship between what happened before and what is happening now, like what I found in Gangnam of Seoul. And with the help of my research team at the GSD, I was able to identify singularities of each city that we must, make, we must make special attention to to tackle the very origin of the problem. In case of Paris, there is abandoned limestone quarry network underneath the city that was used as a channels in 19th century called catacombs, which caused sometimes land subsidence, land subsidence issue in the city. It was an exciting moment when I found that some professional in a city is actually doing something with their own past and current. For example, an architectural practice called Field Works of Paris suggested that the empty chorus should be connected to the new housing development above ground so that the underground space can be used as geothermal energy resource, which would result in saving the energy of heating and cooling. An issue of Life magazine, dated 1949, presented such an amazing vertical illustration of the city's subterranes that holds up the thriving above ground. Since it was as of 1949, I'm sure it must get much, much more complicated by now. But it says, 12,000 miles of power cable, 27 miles of pneumatic tubes to speed mails at 30 miles per hour, 54 miles of steam mains, and it goes on and on and on. And finally, the water tunnels as deep as 800 meter, which is 240 meter. Um, I'm now too familiar with inch, uh, mile, and um, feet. Time to get back to the metric again. Um, through the mapping exercise of NIC, uh, comparing the pre-grid Manhattan from the map dated 1609 with the present condition, it is visible that there are many thin brooks and rivers now lost and hidden underground. Surprisingly, and, not, and also not surprisingly at the same time, the areas currently deal with pluvial flooding in Manhattan overlaps with those areas indicated on the maps as lost rivers. So knowing the past and the layers of time will help us to survive the climate change. And as the profession who has the intellectual tool that understands the scale, both in planar and vertical dimensions, with collaborative attitude, should and can lead the action. I wanted to become a geologist when I was young. And it is quite funny and intriguing that I'm getting back to the deeper ground, thinking layers of time as a landscape architect. The research of lost nature of highly urbanized cities and trying to find the ties between the current climatic changes, challenges, and the lost nature, we cannot talk about what to do with above ground without knowing and thinking about underground. So speaking about teaching the future generation, understanding the deep verticality of cities 
and including infrastructure in the scope of the landscape architecture is the key in the era of climate change. And those are major objectives of my design studios and seminar at the GSC. <clears throat> a couple of weeks ago, a report that presents uh, my recent two design studios was published by the Harvard GSC. Um, it's available online right now, and it will be published in paper copies as well. On the abandoned subway infrastructure of Boston and the relevant adaptive reuse strategy of them. The studios claim that the underground and its associated infrastructure is and should be the realm of landscape architecture. Boston subway system is the oldest in the United States and the second oldest in the world. In total, 61 disused infrastructure, both above and underground, mostly in the prime location of the city. And my students performed such extensive research with historical maps, blueprints, site visits, and the almighty Google Earth to identify and categorize them into five typologies. <clears throat> Boston is a city of emerald necklace and the legacy of this great man who, all have, who you, you all have seen more than enough for the last three days. It's still very strong. And it is true that the city is the one of the most livable places in the world thanks to the park system that he designed. But it is almost 100 years old now and cannot serve the current demand of the site and changing climate. It is becoming outdated. So I asked students to ponder how the abandoned infrastructure could complement the outdated public space, especially in extreme weather condition of Boston. The potential of underground space with a consistent pleasant temperature is huge. Can the abandoned subway infrastructure be a chance for suggesting different type of public space under the extreme weather? One group of students suggested to transform the disused subway infrastructure to the burial network, considering the two fact that the United States and Boston area are running out of burial space, as well as we, all, as, as we all saw through pandemic, and the unique culture of the United States, the role, the role of cemetery as public space. So having Brattle Tunnel, uh, which is 150 meter long, and 20 meter wide underneath the Harvard Square, abandoned since 1960s as a site for detailed design. They perform at the beginning sunshade study to figure out which part of the surface is best for punctuation, for planting and runoff rerouting. And came up with the idea of using Brattle Tunnel as a charnel space with density of 45% compared to Mountain Urban Cemetery, which is 1.9%. And MBTA, the owner of the Boston subway system, was just thrilled to hear about the idea, since this was the strategy that can also make a huge revenue for the um, company, as well as serving for the social demand. At the, uh, an architecture student who took my studio, I proposed heated public pool, leveraged by the geothermal heat underground. Imagine, imagining being in the pool in a um, minus 20 Celsius degree uh, January day just made all uh, pleasant. I always invited related engineers and scientists to the studio um, so that students can work with them to make their concept more specific and realistic. But then always emphasize the importance of the ambience and the sense of space because that is the strength of our profession as designers compared to scientists and engineers. How do we celebrate the inherent beauty of the space? Visiting the Tremont Tunnel, which is the oldest subway tunnel in the United States, was an enlightening moment that reminded me infrastructure can also provide citizens with an elevated level of cultural venue with their unique aesthetic value. What is the joy that only the new type of public space we proposed from the disused tunnels can offer that Emerald Necklace can't? But to be able to design such public space, we must understand the structure and logic of the infrastructure and of subterrain. 
Esther and Min, uh, who took my studio last spring, proposed to transform the network into the network sensorial pleasure that also function as water infrastructure in the case of torrential rain that gray infrastructure cannot hold. Understanding the structure and regional hydrology were crucial to come up with such a sophisticated and elegant spatial strategy for the long abandoned infrastructure. So this fall, starting next to Wednesday, I will teach a seminar that requires the students to pick one city out of 12 uh, I made lost nature map of, and to develop vertical maps of the past and current and strategy of natural artificial resource disposition to mitigate the impact of climate change. Peter Grofman, uh, the geologist who wrote a remarkably interesting article on the homogenization of urban ecology resulted from the identical landscape practice in American cities, told me one time that I love working with landscape architects who can actually do stuff that I am researching. How thinking on deep verticality of time and space can help our practice and help save the world eventually. So after Yongyeo and Ji Hwan's research on Gangnam high soil organic carbon profile, my research team mapped out the potential redevelopment apartment housings aged more than 35 years in Gangnam area. They are all with only one base level currently, but once they would be under the redevelopment, they tend to be digging deep to make five to seven underground levels, which will disturb all the carbon rich layers and without adequate planning ahead, the carbon will be just released to the air. So I want to see if there is any design solution that would make those apartment complex more self-sustaining by designing the disposition of carbon-rich soil, groundwater, and runoff. This is one of the sites that Youngner's team found the high carbon stock underneath. And I went deeper to map the vertical profile of the site soil profiles, groundwater, and any specific infrastructure that the site has. To find a spot for artificial recharging during the construction and to make soil disposition strategy. Another case in Gangnam uh, that is GEPO 4 complex with 17 to 6, 26 meter deep bedrock with fluctuating groundwater Surprisingly, all these resources were available in internet, so we cannot really make excuse of lacking any data uh, for not being able to design anything, right? So what I continue to be interested in um, is designing the disposition of natural and artificial uh, resources in a holistic way. This is an apartment complex in the area that was heavily flooded last month where the increased gray infrastructure, was, infrastructure wasn't able to hold the runoff. After all, what I found through landscape architectural way of thinking, gray, blue, green infrastructure are all choreographed on my sketch to slow down the runoff and reduce the burden of culverts, and meanwhile, fully in, utilizing the buried carbon-rich soil somehow to make the above ground landscape as carbon tank. While still waiting for a commission of redevelopment project where I can fully utilize my research findings, hopefully sometime soon, in Park Kim's everyday practice, I try to maintain this attitude of thinking deep, wide, and holistic. This image of the reflection pond of CJ Blossom Park may be the one you saw more than others, and I am also very proud of the fact that it makes the reflection effect even when the water is drained in the severe winter uh, condition. But I am as proud about this slope design that is a result of two years of tedious negotiation with the municipality and, in, and, and engineers to transform the severely cut edge to 30% slope that offers temporary cascade under rain and rest point for both citizens and the CJ uh, people. And it is obviously safer to potential landslide under a cloudburst event. <clears throat> this image of Yanghua Riverfront is the one widely published. 
They show the cultural aspect of the riverfront very well, including the riverbed edge and barrier-free circulation and all. But the contrast is before and after shots are making is quite beautiful. Topographical transformation of the riverfront made the mud cleaning efforts after annual flood much easier, and there are many citizens enjoying the water edge even during the rain event. <clears throat> Thanks to the topography, mud deposited with anticipated pattern, and after the 10 years of the completion, we observed the emergence of the mud beach that relieved our nostalgia to the lost sand beach of the Han River, and maybe even better for the bird and fish. And it was extra rewarding that the riverfront appeared in Squid Game, that maybe you all watched, as a backdrop for Chang Jae Lee's scene of agony, as a longtime fan of Mr. Lee. We are neither engineers nor scientists by training but we can use their expertise to achieve our design goals through the tools and knowledge that we already have, or we are supposed to have, as professionals. To be able to do so, in other words, to think like landscape architects, to mitigate the origin of the problem, we must. First, we need to zoom in and out from the scale of microcosm to the scale of continent. Second, Make friends with engineers and scientists. Read and watch what they are finding every day and keep keen interest in them to collaborate with them whenever an opportunity arises, as Park Kim always do, as we did for this competition on Tanchan, for which we intensively worked with a hydrologist to come up with the ideal width and depth of the urban stream to make it as resilient as possible. Third, we need to fully utilize our ability to think on both planar and vertical dimensions, because that is our strength and what we are capable of. This is my most favorite drawings of all from Yanghua project, which is not an end product, but the product of such a long design process that finally yield the space. So, By uh, rigorous and tenacious research, teaching, and collaboration, yet deeper and wider than we are asked, by designing the disposition of the layers of time accumulated underneath the sites we are given, I believe we, the landscape architect, can help save the world. Thank you very much, and please let it run till Julian and Heike step up. Thank you very much.